But one of the reasons Jeffrey Epstein is is really uh, important is because uh, a lot of the situation in which we find ourselves, whether it's uh, impending economic collapse, transhumanism, uh, all sorts of this stuff. He had his hands in those pies and a lot more. And if you were to pull on the Epstein thread, I guess you could say, uh, you're, you start to unravel a lot of the bigger picture. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome back, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. It is November of 2022, and look what just popped up in the newswires, courtesy of our friends at the Daily Mail. Exclusive Miss Popularity, Glenn Maxwell's life behind bars is hardly bleak, as the sought-after ex-socialite strolls with a prison pal, is chosen to lead Battle of the Units Checkers competition, and guides inmates to the best romance books in the library. Hard-hitting report from Daily Mail, including grainy out-of-focus shots of Glenn Maxwell, I guess, jogging in the prison yard. Wow. Exciting stuff. And guys, I know everyone out in my audience knows that this the real story of Glenn Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein, what really happened there, is so much bigger than what you will ever find in tabloid reports like this. But I think we understand what a report like this is really about. It is about essentially the, well, that whole thing happened, done and dusted, and oh, here's the little tabloid gossip bits that will keep you entertained. But what do you know? The whole thing happened. She's convicted. We never found out anything about anyone that was involved with this, and it will never really dig into that again. Right, guys? If only someone would come along and write a book about this saga. Oh, wait, someone did, and here it is. Uh, wait, I still got more. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yes, the two volume One Nation Under Blackmail by Whitney Webb. And yes, I jest, of course, this is not actually One Nation Under Blackmail because I have the electronic copy. But if I had the physical copy, it would be this process. I have uh, no doubt because it is a behemoth of a work. 900 pages, two volumes on the real Jeffrey Epstein story and digging into that and uncovering and naming names and going in detail into those names and connections. It is a monumental work, and I trust that many in my audience have already have their copy. If not, of course, you can follow the link in the show notes for this interview to find out how to get it. But let's bring on the author herself, Whitney Webb. Whitney Webb of UnlimitedHangout.com, author of One Nation Under Blackmail. Thank you very much for joining us today on The Corporate Report. Thanks. I am thrilled to be here. Well, first, and I'm thrilled me... that you took the time to read my massive book. <laughs> I know. It was... It was an undertaking, and I'm not a slow reader, but this is incredibly dense material, and there's it's a lot dense, of it. Yeah. And so, I reading through this, I, 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 at a certain point, I was reading it like an encyclopedia. Uh, I, I, there's no way that I can yeah. possibly contain all of this, these connections and, and links in my head at the same time at any point, but uh, you start to get the sense of the vast interconnected web of that this uh, story is detailing. So first of all, my congratulations on putting this together. I know it must have been a Thanks. monumental undertaking. Yeah. How many years in the making was this book? Um, so I signed the contract to do the book in January 2020 before all the COVID madness, right? And um, I lost daycare for a couple months there because of quarantines and all that fun stuff. So uh, I was originally supposed to have it out sooner, as people that pre-ordered the book probably know. Uh, and then it ended up being a lot bigger than I originally anticipated, and the publisher split it into two into two volumes. But it was always intended to be written in, in two parts. And so for people that don't know, the Epstein-focused portion of the book is volume two, which was originally going to be part two of the book. And volume one is sort of the... Um, understanding how the network that that enabled and supported Epstein in which he, you know, in which he operated, you know, sort of the origins of that and how it got to Epstein, I guess. Right. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that structure because as I think most people if they were going into this book thinking this is a book about Epstein and then they start reading volume 1 and we're in the 1940s yeah. talking about Operation yeah. Underworld and Lucky Luciano and like what? <laughs> Tell us about the structure <laughs> of this book. 
Yeah, so basically, uh, this is born out of my effort that originally started when I worked at Mint Press News to figure out the intelligence connections of Jeffrey Epstein after, as uh, probably a lot of your viewers are are aware, um, Alex Acosta, then Secretary of Labor under Trump, had previously been an attorney, uh, I think U.S. Attorney of Florida or something like that, and had to sign off on what is known as Epstein's sweetheart deal uh, during his first arrest. And he told the Trump transition team, you know, in, in getting trying to get that position of, of secretary for labor that he'd been told that Epstein had belonged to intelligence and to leave him alone. He's above his pay grade and to just sign off on the thing, right? So, you know, what were those intelligence ties? Which intelligence agencies? Or was it multiple agencies? Was he an asset? Was he an agent? What was he doing for intelligence? So that whole effort took me, uh, you know, it took a while to unpack. And you really have to understand how intelligence works. I think a lot of people look at, you know, the CIA or Mossad or uh, MI5 or, you know, whatever, as sort of like monoliths, like they don't have these transnational connections or they don't have ties to other entities outside of themselves. And it's, it's, a, it's a lot more complicated than that. I mean, you even have people, for example, taking the CIA um, as an example, you have people that, you know, are disillusioned in the CIA, sort of making their own private CIA spinoffs that are like private intelligence agencies. You have oligarchs basically having their own intelligence agencies like the Rockefeller family and stuff that gets talked about in the book to an extent. And so, you know, it, it's definitely... Uh, in order to really understand what was going on with Epstein and the intelligence connections, you kind of have to understand the history how, of how these agencies developed, right? And how they interact with uh, corporate power, with organized crime, with government, and like all other sorts of stuff. Well, so. there, yeah, for people who are interested in that aspect of intelligence, there is no lack of information in here. So taking a page from your book, metaphorically or literally, why don't, instead of going straight into, okay, so who was Epstein and who was he working for? Why don't we back into this from some of the... Because I, I think of this sort of in the same way that I, I approached the Who is Bill Gates documentary. It's ostensibly about Bill Gates, but it's really about all of the different connections and the things that he's investing in, and you sort of use that to go out on the spokes to see the, the different web of things that are involved here. And I think similarly with this, it's, a, I guess, about Epstein, but it's about much, much more than Epstein. So so let's yeah let's play a little game then I guess um, word association uh, uh, let's talk about some of the characters that appear in this work and how they are associated with this story and one that I wanted to start with um, because it's a, an interesting name and one that will be familiar even to Joe Q normies in the audience the name of Khashoggi of course most people are thinking of Jamal Khashoggi because of course He's been in the news for the past few years, uh, or his death has been in the news for the past few years. But no, we're talking about Khashoggi's uncle, Adnan Khashoggi, who definitely makes an appearance in this book. Tell us about Adnan Khashoggi and his connection to this intelligence web that is uh, being talked about here. Sure. So uh, before I get to that, though, really quickly, you know, this is one of the reasons why volume one ended up basically happening. You're writing about Jeffrey Epstein and you're, you know, he, he be, um, Adnan Khashoggi becomes one of his clients, for example, after he leaves Wall Street and, and Bear Stearns in the early 80s. And I was like, well, I guess, you know, I think most people only really have a superficial understanding of Adnan Khashoggi. And not just that, but like Iran Contra in general, or things like Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, or the savings and loan scandal, and all of this stuff. That you that in order to get the big picture and like really understand this period and what Epstein was doing there, you kind of have to know this history, right? So you know, in short, talking about someone like Adnan Khashoggi, most people think of him, if you know anything about him at least, you know, as like a Saudi arms dealer. But really, you know, he's a lot more than that. Um, you know, he had um, connections to pretty much every intelligence agency um, and uh, was involved. Uh, he he in, was involved in creating the Safari Club, um, which was like sort of a conglomerate of different intelligence agencies and um, all sorts of other things as well. He was he had a yacht that later gets sold to Donald Trump. Um, but why, you know, it's Khashoggi is using it. He basically has a, a group of women that, according to one woman that was in this group, they were used as sexual bait, uh, basically for the purpose of sex blackmail. He had ties to like a sex blackmail ring based in Europe, run by a, a lady named Fortuna Israel, um, and all other sorts of, you know, 
uh, bits and bobs in his in his career. Um, so you start to look at people like Adnan Khashoggi, you know, people like Jeffrey Epstein stop looking like an anomaly in a lot of the mainstream narrative about Epstein that people have been fed by the mainstream press is that, you know, Epstein's an anomaly. He was the one bad billionaire and now he's dead. So everything's fine. But really you find out that history is littered with these people. And, you know, more often than not, they're the people really involved uh, with a lot of the, you know, political scandals that we remember and hear about. Um, and in the case of Adnan Khashoggi, probably the biggest scandal that he's known for being involved in is Iran-Contra, that he was one of the main people that sort of uh, helped initiate that and, and, and initiated uh, parts of it by making like the first move of money to secure trust with the Iranians. Um, and, you know, Epstein uh, took him on as a client specifically for financial stuff. And uh, Khashoggi's main bank at this time was BCCI, the Bank of Credit, Com uh, Credit and Commerce International, which a lot of people think was only set up by Pakistani intelligence, but there's alleged CIA links in there too. And, you know, they were really involved with a lot of intelligence agencies. And BCCI was really, in my opinion, more like a private intelligence apparatus than a bank, but obviously doing banking stuff too. And you even have them in being involved in like sex trafficking of minors to the elites of the United Arab Emirates and all of this stuff. So, I mean, it's a really, it's a really crazy uh, and honestly, like horrendously nasty world to step into. But you know, if this is the world that Jeffrey Epstein's in, you know, this is going on in the 1980s. Um, you know, these types of guys like Khashoggi were doing that well before Epstein was like even, even on the scene, really. Um, and so, uh, you know, the Khashoggi link may be one of like the earlier connections that Epstein has to the world of intelligence. Um, but it's not exactly clear when they linked up, but oddly enough, in the same period of time when they're supposed to have linked up, uh, Adnan Khashoggi becomes a client of two other people that were, um, also have similar connections in this, um, in this, in this story that, you know, I cover in the book. Uh, he took on Roy Cohn as his lawyer and he took on Robert Keith Gray as a PR executive. And both of those guys, as I note very extensively in the book, uh, have into like very deep ties to intelligence, uh, sex, bla sex, blackmail operations. And in Robert Keith Gray's case, you know, um, uh, ones that targeted U S Congress, like extensively resulting in the, uh, much covered up page boy scandal of the early eighties. And uh, I mean, it's, I don't know if you want me to pause because there, there's obviously a lot <laughs> Honestly, more I can say. Honestly, my task as an interviewer today is literally impossible. There's no way that we can really cover the depth of what you have in this book. All I can do is gesture towards the incredible amount of information contained herein. And I think what your answer there perfectly encapsulates, there's about 15 different directions we could go even from just yeah. what you have said right there. But I want to go back to what you were saying earlier, that people tend to think of intelligence agencies as these monolithic institutions yeah. with a, a hierarchical structure that functions this way. When, uh, yeah, look at something like Iran-Contra, look at BCCI, look at the way these things actually function. What, what was BCCI? It was a bank, yes, but it was also intimately connected to all of these different corporate and business and intelligence interests that converged on these operations that it was clearly helping to finance. Hey, if you were in an intelligence agency and you wanted to finance things around the globe, it would help, certainly help to have some sort of banking function that you could turn to. So is it is it an adjunct of these intelligence agencies? Was it an intelligence agency in itself? How did that function? These are the types of things that are broached by these many, 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 many connections. Um, but Let's just keep going on because there's, again, there's too much to possibly encapsulate here, but we need to get to at least some of the main figures in this story. Another one I think is incredibly important to note would be Leslie Wexner, or should that be the yeah. demon that inhabited Leslie Wexner? I don't know. Yeah, Tell people nuts. about Wexner. Yeah, so, um, well, you alluded to how I start one of the chapters about Leslie Wexner. There's two chapters pretty much devoted to him in the book, but, you, you know... Um, I think most people think of him as a retail mogul. Um, and I mean, yeah, he certainly is that, but you know, there's a lot more to Leslie Wexner. And I think he's one of those billionaires who generally historically has been really publicity shy. He doesn't want stories about him out there. I mean, he's a pretty private guy. And you know, when you start seeing the type of like publicity profiles he's done in the past, I think you realize when he started doing less of them because he says really insane stuff. Um, but he also has, um, 
I mean, there's a really dark underbelly to this guy. And when you consider that he's uh, Jeffrey Epstein's, you know, main benefactor uh, for an extensive part of this period, you know, it's pretty unsettling. And you start to look at the limited clothing company that he runs and all this in a very different light and as, as being not just involved with, in, you know, intelligence operations and getting involved with the airline that, that was like central and Iran Contra for drugs and arm running and all this stuff. It, start, it becomes the airline of the limited after that pretty much. And, um, all other sorts of stuff are going on there, but you also have organized crime connections that are documented by police and like state law enforcement and all other sorts of, of crazy things in the Leslie Wexner story. And on top of that, um, you have the situation that you alluded to uh, a second ago um, where Leslie Wexner in 1985 tells New York magazine and it's woven throughout the story. And I would recommend people go and read uh, the article yourself. Cause it sounds really fantastical. Like there's no way they would put that out, but it's there. Um, and Leslie Wexner is basically like, um, yeah, so I have this thing called a de book and it tells me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it looks just like me, but you know, I have like my person, I have two personalities and like all this stuff in it. I mean, it's really nuts. So de book and, and, and uh, D Y B U K. Um, you look it up in Jewish encyclopedias and secular encyclopedias, and across the board, it is the Yiddish term for demonic possession. So the guy is, um, you know, it depends on how you feel, I guess, but, you know, he's either mentally ill and has like a split personality disorder, or if you believe in that sort of stuff, he really thinks he is or is or is proud of it, at least. And why would you brag about that stuff in something that's nationally read, like New York Magazine? It's, uh, it's beyond. And, um, in around that same period of time, he was doing those profiles. His tax lawyer gets a shot in the face, uh, right before he's about to testify to an IRS, uh, investigation into a whole web of craziness that I, I try and cover in the book, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty insane. It's technically an unsolved murder, but there was a police report that was highly suppressed and uh, that's directly about the murder. And, pretty much the whole document, which is reproduced in the appendix of, of volume two of, of the book, um, is all about Leslie Wexner and organized crime connections. And they're pretty extensive. And they, they tie in very much with the same network that I'm talking about in, in volume one and, and all of that. So they yeah, certainly it's, it's do. It's pretty um, wild stuff. The, the weirdest part is that when you mentioned the book, suddenly your audio went really crazy for a second. So <laughs> maybe it's haunting our conversation. <laughs> oh, no. I don't know. But um, yeah, let's talk about not just Wexner as a person. Actually, one thing that uh, you noted in here that is fascinating is that after the point at which he comes together with Epstein, suddenly he starts changing his style of dress, his appearance, yeah. his mannerisms all start to change. What is the implication there? I mean, Epstein was mind controlled Wexner or something weird happened when they met. What, how did that, what, what's your, you know, I don't really know how to make sense of it, but yeah, I mean, there, there was something very different. And I think you could say that maybe he got involved in different types of activity that made him feel, you know, different, special, different, you know, uh, uh, I mean, if you're starting to get more involved with organized crime and intelligence, you're like, yeah, I'm a spy and all this stuff. I don't know. Maybe it's something like that. I don't really know. Well, um, let's talk uh, about what he did with his riches, because, of course, he didn't just accumulate wealth. He tried to use it for various things like the Wexner Foundation. Tell us about some of the things that he was involved in through that. Yeah, so the Wexner Foundation was made in the 80s, the same period when he's basically claiming to be demon-possessed in the Jewish faith. And he starts focusing first on training leaders uh, in, uh, for the North American Jewish community. Um, and then subsequently in the late 80s, starts focusing on training leaders uh, for the Israeli government. And so you have a guy that, you know, is saying he's possessed by a demonic force training leaders that are going to be put in prominent positions of power in the Jewish community, both in the United States or in North America. And then in Israel, I mean, that's pretty insane. You know, it's sort of like uh, someone funding, uh, you know, a clergy, Catholic clergy with a fast track to the Vatican. And he's like telling New York magazine, he's like possessed by the devil. I mean, it's kind of like, why has no one complained about this? It, it kind of makes you wonder, but, um, 
anyway, um, part of the Wexner Foundation's origins are in an organization that pops up a couple times in the book called Benai Brith, which is also the parent organization of the Anti-Defamation League. And going way, 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 way back in like the New York Times archives, you can find articles about Benai Brith, and they basically describe themselves as like Jewish Freemasons. It's a secret society. So there's you know, some intrigue there perhaps, right? Um, but beyond that, you know, a- around like the early 90s and stuff, Wexner and also Epstein uh, get really involved in Harvard University. And so they're uh, programmed to train um, to have Israel, I think that's called uh, Wexner Israel Fellows or something like that. They start getting involved at the Harvard Kennedy School and then um, – Wexner uh, basically funds into existence the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard, and David Gergen is put in charge of that, uh, which is interesting in and of itself, and uh, basically funds this center. Uh, Most of its funding comes from him, or it comes from people that are also in the Epstein story, like Glenn Dubin and Leon Black, some of the, you know, big fancy people. Um, Oh, people with a lot of money in Epstein circle also end up on the board of the CPL. Um, and this organization uh, openly teams up with the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders Program. And uh, I think by now there's this viral clip, right, of, of Klaus Schwab saying, like, well, penetrate the cabinets and stuff. Well, he's saying that at the Center for Public Leadership, and he's saying it to David Gergen at this organization that Wexner has basically brought into existence. So, I think it's just one example of how, you know, it's not just the WEF that are putting like their people into positions of power and penetrating the cabinets. There's like a lot of people, I guess, that do this, that are oligarchs that see that as a way to advance their influence. And Leslie Wexner is a big one for sure. And especially when it comes to Israel's government. You know, it's interesting because I've had my eye on Gergen since I first started getting into this and Bohemian Grove and connections like that and things like that. Right. And so I've always had sort of this distaste for Gergen, but never really had anything substantial, never really looked into it. But seeing yeah, but the, think about the Wexner- it, though. We- Wexner funds and basically creates the Center for Public Leadership. He had a role in choosing Gergen to run that. Mm, yeah. So that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, right? that, I, and I and learned I that from this Gergen book. I didn't know that until for, now, but it suddenly makes sense. Yeah. And then Schwab and Gergen talking together about the Young Global Legal Leader Program. It's What fun you know, guys. Yeah, 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 exactly. Crazy connections. All right, let's, uh, I think we have to bring Maxwell into this equation, but less sure. Ghislaine and more Robert Maxwell. Let's talk about Papa Maxwell. Man, okay, well, I mean, I probably could have written a whole book on Robert Maxwell. That guy had a very crazy, interesting life, and I didn't even get into a lot of things he was involved with, too, like um, his influence on uh, academic journals and the sciences and, like, the peer review system or, like, uh, video games even. But, you know, what he's mostly known for, well, in the 80s and stuff, early video, but anyway, he's mostly known as, like, a media mogul, right? And, uh, and of have, have being really competitive with, like, Rupert Murdoch. Um, and then, you know, at one point was a labor MP and all of this stuff. And his media empire imploded, you know, upon his death. But it was in trouble before then. And it turned out he stole all this money from the pension funds. I think that's what most people, you know, know about Robert Maxwell. But the story is a lot more complicated than that. Um, and not to go too deep into into his history and everything he was doing, but... Around the 60s or so, he gets recruited by Israeli intelligence, but he has links with other intelligence agencies as well. And probably the most important one behind Israel is going to be the ones in uh, the Soviet Union, uh, either the KGB or Bulgarian intelligence. Um, You know, uh, those play a a really big role in Robert Maxwell's story. And um, at some point, um, well, around the 1980s or so, he has a role in Iran-Contra. He has a role in uh, sending the uh, Israeli nuclear whistleblower uh, to prison. And then he also um, is involved in the Promise software scandal in a very uh, significant way. And... And so these are, you know, major espionage activities taking place, many of which are gravely undermining U.S. national security, at least in the case of uh, Promise, at least. And in the same period, he also gets um, formally in business with organized crime outfits, particularly those in in Russia or the Soviet Union in this period, I guess, Um, um, like the... um, uh, Simeon Mogilevich, I think is how you say his name, and and people like that. And... um, 
in the years before his death, which also coincides with his efforts to uh, make his new headquarters New York City, which is why Ghislaine Maxwell was there, um, he sets into motion uh, what FBI special agents in New York called a global coalition of criminals, basically uniting a bunch of different um, organized crime communities uh, in Asia, the Eastern Bloc, um, really all over the world, coming together to, um, you know, grift together basically and expand their their rackets on a you know an international scale in a very significant way so robert maxwell's story you know is definitely a lot more than just media mogul but when you talk about the media mogul aspects as i note in the book um a lot of his acquisitions uh, in that particular period were guided by a man named robert peary who was in charge of um rothschild inc uh, and at this period in the 1980s, Rothschild Inc. had existed on Wall Street before then, but apparently the Rothschild family uh, wasn't very interested. They sort of just let it do its own thing. They didn't exercise direct control over that. And in this period, realized that was a mistake. And so in order to uh, expand their footprint on Wall Street, they wanted to go in mergers and acquisitions. And so they recruited uh, mainly three corporate raiders uh, who were British or um most established in Britain uh, for that purpose of the, uh, the and so they um, became involved in uh, you know corporate raiding I guess but in in the U S and taking over com- corporate takeovers and things like that and so a lot of the expansion of Robert Maxwell's um, media empire in that period uh, was basically. Uh, because of that, right? And Robert Maxwell was one of the corporate raiders they chose. Another one was uh, this guy named James Goldsmith, who I talk about a lot in the book. And Epstein is hanging out at Goldsmith's house as early as 1971, when he's like a college dropout and stuff. So there's definitely some interesting stuff going on there, uh, to say the very least. But you basically have, um, you know, this particular bank, um, you know, basically... um, Uh, sort of guiding aspects of Robert Maxwell's business empire, which is pretty significant. And if I'm not, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this, but, uh, if I, I, if I'm not mistaken, Donald Trump in the early nineties, when he was facing bankruptcy was sort of bailed out by this same bank, which is kind of interesting because in the last, um, few years of Robert Maxwell's life, um, among other people, Donald Trump was one of the people seen on the lady Ghislaine yacht sort of schmoozing with these types of, of people. And when the mainstream media likes to report on, you know, Trump and the Russian mob, uh, what they're not really saying is that these are the old business partners um, of Robert Maxwell. And if you look at Trump's reaction to the arrest of uh, Jeffrey Epstein in 2019, and then the subsequent arrest of Ghislaine Maxwell, his reactions to those are quite different. Uh, With Jeffrey Epstein, he was like, oh, I'm not a fan, uh, not a fan of the guy at all. We parted ways, you know, many years ago. And then with Ghislaine, he said, I wish her well. So there seems to be some kind of a some some interesting um, yeah. you know facets. But the the of, Trump mm-hmm. the, the Trump uh, 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 sympathizers in the crowd, shall we say, will go. Oh well, the, he was clearly being sarcastic. That's a thing, you know. <laughs> oh, wish you well. That means like, oh, I hope you get raped in prison or something. Ha ha ha. Um, because unfortunately, people. Uh, there, well, I don't know. I, I've spent the last five years hearing from people who will defend Trump and everything that he was involved with. I think they Man, have, well, I think they're now backing away from that position largely and like, oh, I never supported <laughs> Trump. <laughs> but, but let's get into that because you raise an important point. Yes, the, 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 the sort of the stupid mainstream propaganda narrative is that Trump was controlled by Putin. Um, the slightly more detailed version is he was controlled by the Russian mob. But the, the, the story that you get into here in the book is more complicated than that. But that, yes, goes back to these figures that were directly linked to Robert Maxwell. And clearly Trump and Epstein had a relationship. No one disputes that. That was out in the open. And we do not know the exact particulars. But what, were, what did you manage to uncover about the Trump-Epstein relationship? Yeah, so the way it looks to me is that um, Jeffrey Epstein, why he's involved in this intelligence financial stuff and Iran-Contra stuff and Adnan Khashoggi, he's also getting involved in real estate. And so in a lot of early um, articles that mention Epstein, 
in the 90s and the early 2000s, they don't call him like billionaire or like financial advisor or any of these other terms that are used later. They call him property developer. So he has a lot of involvement in real estate, and he's actually in the late 80s sharing offices with a real estate family with ties, uh, alleged ties to organized crime called the Gulettas, and really focusing on a lot of these markets. And he's doing that also with Leslie Wexner, who's also very involved in Manhattan real estate. Um, and all sorts of characters and who's another big player in New York real estate. Well, that would be Donald Trump. And so it's been alleged that in the, in the 80s, uh, Tom Barrick of Colony Capital, who's along even now is, you know, relatively closely associated with Trump and was with his um, presidential campaign and subsequent presidency to vary, varying degrees. Um, at a Barrick, uh, Trump and Epstein would socialize a lot together, or hit the nightclubs together and all of this. And they're also um, working in, you know, real estate and distressed real estate and stuff like that. Because uh, Barrick, I believe, also uh, works in like real estate um, through Colony Capital. And um, uh, after that, it, you know, it, it gets a little more um, murky, some of the um, overlaps there. Um, because, you know, there is, there's a lot we don't know about the uh, real estate activities in which Epstein was engaged. There's some really weird ones, though, like him renting from the State Department and all other, you know, weird sorts of stuff uh, that's going on there. But what, um, in terms of, you know, perhaps the, the damning aspects of the Trump-Epstein relationship, I would say that um, in order to explain that, I'd have to explain what I think was going on with the sex trafficking stuff with Epstein. Um, so as I note in the book, I think there were probably two parallel operations that were going on. One is the one everyone knows about, about the exploited uh, girls and the massages and all of this. Um, but there's another tier of girls who are, you know, lured in the same way uh, with offers of help and all this stuff, but they actually receive that help and then are cultivated, uh, you know, even if they're recruited underage by the time, you know, they cultivate them well, you know, uh, over the age of 18 educate them all this stuff and they become uh, the wives and girlfriends of the elite in this social circle. And uh, when it comes to Trump, one of the women that Epstein was cultivating in this way in the early 90s was a Norwegian heiress named Selena Middelfart, who actually accompanied Epstein on one of his visits to the Clinton White House in the 90s. And she became Donald Trump's uh, girlfriend in this period as well after dating Epstein. And then the subsequent girlfriend Trump has after middle fart is his current wife, Melania, who allegedly was introduced to Trump also by, by Maxwell and Epstein. So um, there's other cases besides Trump of these women, including many of the women that accompanied Trump uh, to the Clinton White House of sort of getting involved with people in, in Epstein's social circle that were you know, very wealthy Epstein to the Clinton White House. You mean? Oh, sorry. Yeah. May have mis misspoken there. Yeah, yeah uh, because most of Epstein's White House visits, there were 17 of them. Several of them he's accompanied by attractive young women. And a lot of those women, after time, end up sort of uh, becoming, you know, uh, girlfriends or wives of, you know, people much older and wealthier and powerful than, than they are. But a lot of those men have, uh, you know, telling connections to Epstein's network. Right. And that that was certainly something that I noticed as I was going through volume two. It was like, and this model became the wife of this, this, this old fart. And <laughs> anyway, yeah, it was as, yeah, this former Epstein girlfriend became the wife of this. Uh, yeah. This. But it, returning to Trump for a second, yeah. though, yeah, real estate seems to have been a common theme there. And if you ask me about Jeffrey Epstein's involvement in real estate, he was most likely using it to facilitate the other financial crimes in which he was like provably or most likely engaged at at distinct periods in his career because uh, real estate is a really useful way to launder money for a lot of people. And Epstein over the course of his career was very involved in money laundering. Um, so, you know, that's probably why, but you know, their supposed tiff that, you know, ruined their friendship and all of this was over um, a, a Palm, Palm beach mansion that they both wanted to buy and they were sort of got competitive and, you know, why did they want the mansion? I think the person that actually ended up buying it, like, bulldozed it or something. But it was probably not, you know, because they wanted to live there. They wanted to, you know, use that purchase for something, whatever that was. I would argue it was probably, you know, for financial uh, fun and games, <laughs> for right. lack of a better term. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, yeah, again, an entire 
field of study. An entire book could be written about all of that shenanigans. Um, but let's let's return to Maxwell for a moment. Um, specifically Robert Maxwell's death, because I think it is instructive to take a look at that, because, of course, the mainstream story, suicide, the the more plausible story, it was a hit of some sort. Um, maybe we don't have all the details of that, but the first thing that might occur to people is, well, if Robert Maxwell was so in, involved in this world and was presumably so protected by being, you know, in with all these intelligence agencies, well, then... Why would, how could he, how could he possibly die? It's like the same sort of reasoning that Epstein couldn't, no, he didn't die. He was, he had cosmetic surgery and was put on some island somewhere and is living the life, you know, these days. Because people cannot ex accept the idea yeah. that these people are pawns in this greater scheme rather than the, the big kingpins of this, this scheme. Yeah, Let's talk so, about Maxwell. Yeah, so Robert Maxwell probably thought he was on top, but he wasn't on top, right? And he's the kind of guy that if you look at his career and his personality also, he's very bombastic. He's probably very narcissistic. And so, the, but he also has a lot of ability too, when it comes to financial stuff, especially in like you know, front companies and like labyrinths of business webs and hiding money in Liechtenstein and tax havens and all this stuff. So the way it looks like to me, it, it sort of happened is that, you know, those people that like spin plates on sticks and stuff, he was like stacking too much. Right. And eventually it started to wobble, um, in the, in the early nineties and, you know, they, they tried to, you know, well before he died, there were efforts after effort, after effort, after effort, after effort to stall, uh, the people that were coming <laughs> to call for like, uh, loans to be paid back and all their sorts of stuff. I mean, he had bankers, uh, at his door all the time in the last couple of years of his life. Um, so, you know, it wasn't just like all of a sudden, right. It was, it was definitely collapsing and they were trying to prevent the collapse. And, it, you know, if, based on people that have, you know, written extensive biographies on Robert Maxwell in this particular period, he was getting really worried and strung out, allegedly made uh, threats to people, uh, particularly intelligence agencies that, you know, he might uh, say stuff if they didn't give him money uh, and all other sorts of stuff. And, you know, I think probably the most telling um uh, at thing here is, you know, think what you want to think about how Robert Maxwell died. His daughter that was closest to him and his activities in this period, Ghislaine Maxwell, thinks her father was killed by uh, renegade Mossad agents and Sicilian contract hitmen. So, you know, um, the official story is that he, you know, it was either an accident or he killed himself or something, you know, but, uh, the person that was closest to him in this period doesn't believe that. All right, so let's so. bring Ghislaine into this story because, as you alluded to earlier, as you go into in the book, um, in the early 1990s, presumably Robert Maxwell essentially was using Ghislaine Maxwell as a way of trying to get into yeah. uh, and woo various American yeah. um, families, most notably the Kennedys, but presumably very anyone focused of, uh, on social the Kennedys status. and that. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that aspect of the operation. Yeah. So Robert Maxwell, um, wanted to basically, he, he pr prior to this felt, you know, uh, he, he got really involved in Bulgaria and like had made t-shirts that said King of Bulgaria and stuff like that. And he wanted to be like that in New York. And he wanted to basically create, um, a political dynasty that r was like the Kennedys. And so in his head, what better way to do that than to actually get my daughter to marry a Kennedy. And, you know, that's pretty much what he attempted to do. And, you know, there's, um, uh, there were efforts of, of Elaine to really get into that social circle. So based on the only Kennedy who would probably speak to me for the purposes of this book, which is, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He said that Ghislaine Maxwell sort of got into, um, uh, his family, uh, through his, uh, ex-wife who is now deceased, Mary Richardson. And this connection happened because she had previously dated prior to him, a man named Carlos Mavrolian and the Mavrolian family, uh, not Carlos himself, but his, I think brother and his father are in Epstein's black book and are a, a shipping family with the intelligence connection. I mean, they pop up in volume one a couple times. And it was apparently, you know, he, he was, uh, he went to school and in elite institutions in the UK at like Eton and stuff like that. And apparently somewhere there he had met Ghislaine Maxwell. And so he, uh, Ghislaine had met Mary Richardson and Mary Richardson 
was sort of the key there. And so that's how um, Ghislaine for, uh, Maxwell, for example, uh, gets invited to the Carrie Kennedy, Andrew Cuomo wedding in 1990. Um, because, uh, Carrie Kennedy and Mary Richardson are best friends and, you know, it, it gets sort of in the mix that way. And she gets uh, photographed and, there, right? Yeah. And she was photographed there, uh, flirting with the eldest son of Robert F. Kennedy, um, who I think is Joseph P. Kennedy, the second or something like that. I can't remember his, his full name. Um, but yeah, he's, it, it's crazy because it's in like a tabloid called the star and it's obviously Ghislaine. If you look at the picture, which again is reproduced um, in the book, but the caption doesn't mention Ghislaine. It's just, but it says they're flirtatiously talking and all of this stuff. And it's not even the first time that, that Joe Kennedy and Ghislaine, well, sorry, that's the first time, but there's a subsequent time when they socialize and schmooze together. And there's pictures of her in the same period, trying to go after John F. Kennedy Jr. and get with him. But he's more interested apparently in hors d'oeuvres than talking to her in one of these photo spreads. It's kind of funny. So I think she, had kind of limited success in this early period. And then of course her father dies and um, you know, something it's not exactly clear what happens then, but she, it's m most likely that she knew Epstein well before her father died. And after her father's death, she's used to being basically the pawn of her father um, managed by her father, even her love life managed by him. So she looks to someone who's very similar to her father and you know, that's Jeffrey Epstein. When you look See, at, you yeah, know, financial criminal the part of this and all this stuff. story that psychologically, I mean, we can only speculate, but it is so weird, deeply weird that she would just go from that sort of controlled relationship with her father. To yeah. Well, if you look at her early childhood, it starts to make a little more sense. Um, like, I think a couple, just a couple days after she was born, the then favorite child of Robert Maxwell, the eldest son, Michael Maxwell, um, is in a car accident and is in a vegetative state from that point on for several years until he dies. And um, basically, as a result of that, Ghislaine Maxwell was neglected as a child to the point where she developed like infant an anorexia and stuff like that, and then goes from complete neglect to then being Robert Maxwell's favorite child. And that has to have an, a pretty intense psycholo psychological impact on you when you're a kid. And then he controls who she can and can't date. And then later on in his own papers, insert salacious gossip that she's having sex with the uh, British aristocrats that deny there's an affair and, you know, basically starts to use her sexuality as a tool and openly tells people, this is my daughter and she's the one that's most like me and all this stuff and start taking him taking her around on all her, on all his trips, but like manages her whole career, every job she has, he gives to her and he, you know, she basically, um, is an extension of him. And so when I mentioned, you know, Robert Maxwell in terms of his personality, like most likely being a narcissist, if you like study him, um, narcissistic parents tend to view their children as extensions of themselves, not as individual beings, Right. And so, you know, he definitely treated Glane that way as like an extension of himself. Well, that opens up a whole other can of worms, because in the 1990s, Glane Maxwell was being introduced to the world as an Internet operator. That's how <laughs> she described herself. Yes. And and that relates to what her sisters were doing. And that mm -hmm. also brings another character into this mix, which is, well, Bill Gates specifically, Microsoft generally. Tell us about that connection. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of detail on that particular story, so I'm probably just going to uh, be going pretty general here. But I, I on Unlimited Hangout, there's like the a lot of the detail is already published if you don't have the book yet and you're interested in learning about this. Um, so in 2001, the Evening Standard published this article about Jeffrey Epstein, and it was mainly focused on Jeffrey Epstein, Galay Maxwell, and Prince Andrew. Um, when it's introducing Jeffrey Epstein uh, to a British audience, he's probably someone else people reading uh, the Evening Standard, you know, probably never heard of. And they call him a property developer and all this stuff. And they say he made most of his money, most of his millions um, because of business links with three men. And those three men are Leslie Wexner, Donald Trump and Bill Gates. But wait, I thought Bill Gates and Epstein didn't meet until 2011. What is he doing here in this 2001 article? Anyway, um. It may have something to do with Ghislaine Maxwell and Ghislaine Maxwell's sisters. So after Robert Maxwell dies in 1991, it's not just Ghislaine that's trying to continue her father's 
work. It's uh, the twin sisters, Christine and Isabel, who uh, have admitted in interviews, which I reproduce in the book, that they were trying to uh, rebuild a piece of their father's legacy. And what they had done previously when their father was still alive, uh, as, uh, especially in the case of Christine Maxwell, was manage the uh, front company that was used to sell the bugged promise software to the Cindia National Laboratory in the United States. So, you know, directly involved in the tech aspect of her father's espionage activities on behalf of Israeli intelligence. So anyway, they create this company called the McKinley Group, which produces the, one of the early search engines called Magellan. And Magellan makes all these deals with, you know, some of the big uh, tech companies at the time, including Microsoft. Uh, the vice president of the McKinley Group is Isabel Maxwell. Isabel Maxwell is the person that makes those uh, deals uh, with those tech titans. Uh, so she would have been the person to have that direct connection uh, with Microsoft. And before I go any further, it's important to point out that Ghislaine Maxwell had a significant stake in this company, as did Kevin Maxwell, who is, uh, wanted to be his father reincorporated after his death and was involved in all other, as uh, many other aspects of this company as well. And um, in 2000, an article that's about Isabel Maxwell because at this point she's in charge of a uh, IDF Israeli intelligence connected called uh, ComTouch which is basically uh, rescued by Paul Allen and, and Microsoft uh, which invest a bunch of uh, money in, in her company when it makes no sense to do so because it's hemorrhaging money and you know has very you know, its product isn't great and it doesn't have a lot of market share and all stuff. But for some reason, they pour a bunch of money into it. And, you know, she's talking about ComTouch in this in this article and is talking about her relationship with Bill Gates, which obviously precedes 2000. And we can assume goes back to this Magellan Microsoft team up, which was like around 1995 or so. And the way, you know, Isabel Maxwell over the years has given lots and lots and lots of interviews about all sorts of stuff. And I, I read as many as I could find. And this is the only one uh, where she talks about Bill Gates. And it's the only one where she is uh, described by the journalist as purring when she talks and uh, d adopts a faux Southern accent, meaning like Southern American accent when talking about Bill Gates and how, uh, I can't remember exactly what she says, but something about like convincing her, convincing him to put money from the foundation into ComTouch or something like that. Um, it's bizarre. So, well, he has to spend three hundred forty million dollars a year. So why not do it this way? <laughs> As she says in the interview. Yeah, so weird. Yeah, yeah. That that that's the quote. Yeah, it's it's super bizarre and definitely uh, deserves further uh, you know investigation to figure out what was up there but obviously something is very weird with why both Paul Allen who ends up with some of these um, women close to Epstein like Nicole Yunkerman who's I think is part of this elite girlfriend and wives op that Epstein was running ends up around Paul Allen whatever and then you know they're dumping money into this company that's losing lots of money and eventually you know basically collapses well gets close to collapsing I mean it never really recovers and becomes a profitable company at any point and um, I'm trying to think of another a uh, couple other points to bring. Oh, yeah. So uh, when it comes to Microsoft also, you know, it's not just the Maxwells. You have like Epstein in the same period is uh, having Nathan Mervold, who's the chief tech technology officer of Microsoft, on his plane. And uh, later when he leaves Microsoft, Mervold leaves Microsoft, uh, he has like uh, Epstein is bringing like young, potentially underage Eastern European women to visit Mervold and his offices and stuff. And around 1998 or so, uh, Mervold takes Epstein on an official Microsoft Russia trip. Uh, that is very interesting um, because they're taking uh, photos in front of um, uh, taking photos with employees of like the nuclear center in Russia, which previously, uh, just a couple months before this, I think, had gotten in trouble. Well, a company, a Silicon Valley company called Silicon Graphics had gotten in trouble for selling them a supercomputer uh, that they weren't supposed to sell. And this whole um, that's, that whole theme ties up with a lot of the stuff I write about with Epstein and the Clinton White House and what was probably going on there and all of that. So there's um, 
you know, a whole bunch of crazy stuff there. So, I mean, if you ask me, like, why mainstream media won't look into this evidence about Epstein, Microsoft, and potentially Bill Gates well before 2011, I think it has a lot more to do with protecting Microsoft than protecting Bill Gates, because by 2011, Bill Gates wasn't really running the show at Microsoft anymore. But he was in this other period of time. And there's a few other Microsoft, uh, you know, executives like Linda Stone and, and some other ones that uh, were very close to Epstein, even even hired people, members of Epstein's entourage as assistants um, and stuff like that. And one of these is, is the people that um, uh, connects Epstein to the MIT Media Lab uh, that he that um, I think the head of that had to resign because of the Epstein donations and Gates apparently donated there and I think somewhere else at Epstein's direction and you know I don't know the whole thing with uh, Gates and, and Epstein and philanthropy is is you know really crazy too um, but the whole philanthropy discussion you know you have this sort of talk about uh the clinton foundation and other stuff in that in that particular conversation but you know there's a reason that that gates was interested in epstein for philanthropy and it's not the reason he's giving i think it's because epstein was a pioneer in this new method of philanthropy uh which is basically impact investing or you know creating a slush fund disguised as a philanthropic organization um and he he was very adept at it Evidently. All right. Um, yeah. And you mentioned in passing in the book about Paul Allen and a small world, which is a, a whole other can of worms. Just yeah, the crazy. social network yeah. that was like owned by, I think, Harvey Weinstein and yep. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, so many different things. So now that we've spent the better part of an hour just picking at the surface of some of these connections and hopefully giving people an idea of how much material is contained in this book, but not really, because you won't get it until you get the 900 pages. But and now that we've done that, now in a sentence or two, <laughs> summarize for us, who was Jeffrey Epstein? Who was he working for? What was he doing? Okay, uh, Jeffrey Epstein was as much a financial criminal as a sex criminal. There's a very particular reason why mainstream media only wants to talk about his uh, sex crimes between 2000 and 2006. Um, Jeffrey Epstein was also not an anomaly in the network in which he operated. Uh, numerous people engaged in sex blackmail and sex trafficking. If you think these issues died with Jeffrey Epstein, you were sorely mistaken. Um, but one of the reasons... Jeffrey Epstein is is really uh, important is because uh, a lot of the situation in which we find ourselves, whether it's uh, impending economic collapse, transhumanism, uh, all sorts of this stuff, he had his hands in those pies and a lot more. And if you were to pull on the Epstein thread, I guess you could say, uh, you're, you start to unravel a lot of the bigger picture and a lot of what is going on right now has its origins decades ago. And basically the people running the show here and that were, uh, you know, that Epstein was fronting for it's, uh, it, the, it, intelligence and organized crime, uh, but it's a symbiosis of those two entities that has become so interconnected. They are one and the same. And these are basically the people that are running most governments in the world today. And again, you demonstrate that throughout the book, the entire book essentially is that thesis just over and over and over and over again through all of these people. And everyone who's even mentioned in passing gets a couple of paragraphs about their operation and how that tied into this and then into another company. And this was tied into that, which we already talked about back several chapters ago. And then this ties into this. It's Again, until you really read through this, you don't get the sense of how this operates. But once you do, you start to realize that, yes, yeah. Jeffrey Epstein might have been a spider in this web, but just one of many. And this was a very, very vast web. Yeah, and it's a, it's, it's a web that continues to exist right now and impact our lives a lot right now. And it definitely, um, you know, deserves to be talked about. And, you know, some people might be thinking, well, 900 pages is a lot. And and like, yes, I understand that. Um, but you have to understand, too, the reason it got so long, I think, is because the thesis is very complicated. And the thesis is complicated to prove because they've made it complicated to prove, uh, you know. Um, 
if you don't have an airtight case for this kind of stuff, you know, I'm going to be opening myself up to a lot of smears. Oh, this conspiracy theorist saying this stuff, we can't take it seriously. So you have to go back in the history to show that the same people do the same uh, crimes, have the same rackets decade over decade over decade over decade. And there's continuity between the crimes of the CIA and the mob and all that stuff of yesteryear basically to now and that it hasn't stopped in this idea that organized crime disappeared and like sexual blackmail that's not a thing in the u.s it's been a thing since like the 40s and the 50s and it's never really stopped and um you know our government clearly does not operate the way we are told it is and um you know uh, there's uh, basically the conversation that needs to be had after reading this book is um the government the cia all of these people here and their networks need to be investigated, but the government isn't capable of investigating itself. So what do we do, right? What do you do in that situation? That is the question, isn't it? But organized crime is in charge. Yeah. You know, you know that's that's ultimately you know what we're we're dealing with here, and um, that's why I thought it was important to go back to sort of the origins of the CIA and how this all sort exactly. of started, because you see from the very beginning uh, who was really behind the OSS and the CIA and and yes, all the of intelligence that, and, agencies are organized crime. They're just the most yeah. organized of the organized crime, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of these arrests over time of, oh, they took down these mob guys, they took down these narco traffickers or, you know, people like that. It's consolidation. They're taking out their competition. That's what's and going Exactly. On. And then there are their cliques and who's connected to who. And yeah, exactly right. Okay. Again, again, we can only gesture at this, but uh, if people read the book, they will truly understand what we're talking about, hopefully in its greater depth. But having said that, Whitney, no one can accuse you of not having done your research. <laughs> in fact, I didn't add it up, but I obviously, literally thousands and thousands of footnotes here. So incredible, incredible uh, encyclopedic work. And at the risk of bringing up uh, back when I was a, a university student studying literature, we'd go to readings all the time. And the the question from the audience that you'd always dread is, how do you write your books? Because it's just such a stupid question with a pencil. Like, I don't know. But, but honestly, I feel compelled to ask in this case, how do you compile a book like this with this much research? How do you keep it in your head at any one time? How do you do this? Okay, so keeping it in my head, I don't really know how to explain that, but like... Uh, a lot of it just sort of sticks around in there. And I, um, you know, I may not remember all the details of a person's name, but I can remember enough to be able to, um, you know, know there's a connection there and go hunt for it later. Um, but I do want to say that this book would not have been possible without a amazing guy named Ed Berger, who was my research assistant and contributed a lot, especially to volume one. Uh, you know, so this was really uh, a group effort and I didn't want to be co-author, but I've, I've done my best to make him feel like one in all but name since he didn't, you know, want that for, for volume one. But he's, uh, you know, uh, done a lot of really incredible detailed original research on stuff. So, you know, I can't take credit for all the research um in volume one specifically, uh, because I mean, there, it's a lot of ground to cover. I mean, it's, you know, a hundred years roughly of, of history. And, you know, I, I wanted it to be very detailed and I had a deadline to meet. Right. And, uh, so I'm really grateful to him, uh, for helping make this happen. And I had some help from other people too. Uh, Johnny Vedmore, uh, my secretary star, uh, formatted, uh, tediously all of the footnotes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank you to her as well. Um, you know, so, you know, it wasn't like, you know, me doing literally all of it. I have a publisher too that helps like edit and obviously gets the book out and stuff, but, um, it was definitely a process and basically the, the structure of it. Uh, I did a four part series on Epstein back in 2019 for Mint Press News. And the first two parts were sort of like pre Epstein. And then the last two parts were about Epstein and Maxwell. So I sort of followed that same uh, model and tried to just be really detailed and really thorough because, you know, the reason I wanted to be so thorough and why it ended up being sort of like a reference book and encyclopedic is because I didn't want to have to go back and like do it again, you know, be like, oh, I left this out or people aren't understanding how I got from here to here. So I wanted to make it like very clear how I got from, from here to there. And, you know, 
Uh, you know, I, I'm sure other people can make summaries and all that other stuff to make it more digestible for people that won't don't want to get into 900 pages. Because ultimately, I just want people to engage with the research and the ideas and the implications of it. Really, you know, more than you know, buying my books or whatever. I just want you know people to read it somehow or like you know, engage with it somehow. Because I worked really hard on it, you know. Because um, I mean, it was definitely a lot of work and. Um, I, I feel like I really need a vacation after finishing this thing, you know what <laughs> you, I mean? You deserve uh, one after this, Whitney. Yeah. I, I, I second that. And <laughs> I, look, I understand because uh, like things with my Al-Qaeda documentary and other things, I put things in there so that later on when I need to remember, oh, what was the connection there? I can go and search my own transcript and go, oh yeah, that guy is connected to that and there's the link and blah, blah, blah. And I have no doubt that you're two volume book here is going to be one of those resources that I turn to when I, a name comes up. I know that Super. name. How do I know it? I'll look <laughs> in the index for one nation under blackmail and reread the section that you wrote about it because it is that kind of incredibly ha handy dandy reference guide for all of this type of information and extensively footnoted and researched. So as one researcher to another, I very, very much appreciate what you did here. And I understand okay, how much incredible work goes into a book like this. So Hats off to you for getting this done. Absolutely an incredible accomplishment. Give yourself a pat on the back. Take a much needed rest. I have more questions, other things, other bits about this that I want to drill more down into, but I think we can keep that for future conversations because I have no doubt we'll be returning to this in the future. I think we'll leave it there for now. Um, first, tell people about how they can get the book and about your work generally at Unlimited Hangout. Okay, so uh, the book is published by Trine Day, T-R-I-N-E Day. So you can go to their website, trineday.com, uh, and that's probably the best place to buy the physical copies of the books, especially if you're uh, in or near the continental U.S. because they bundle them, so it's cheaper than buying one and two separately from a place like Amazon or something like that. But Amazon and other booksellers have those options. Um now that they've been out for a little bit, there's more options for purchase from uh, printers in like Australia, Europe, the UK, and whatever. So it's a little uh, easier in that sense. Um, the ebook version has just come out. Audiobook should be following uh, sometime either the end of this month or or in December, but it's it's definitely in the works. Yeah. So um, all of probably the best place to look for that type of stuff on, on, at unlimitedhangout.com. We have like a resources section and there's a whole page all about the book and, uh, you know, frequently asked questions and all of that stuff. And also if you subscribe to the unlimited hangout newsletter, there's a section at the bottom that we have in the newsletter, at least for now with a link to that page and other other uh, information about the book as it becomes available. And, you know, the newsletter will let people know when the audio book's out and all of that stuff. Um, and in general, Unlimited Hangout is um, where I publish and also uh, publish my work and also republish after a time uh, work I publish on, on other sites like The Last American Vagabond, occasionally Mint Press News, uh, most recently uh, Bitcoin Magazine and some places like that. And, um, yeah, but I have other people that contribute there as well that, you know, basically we specialize in the long form investigative uh, stuff that, you know, is, is relevant to today, even if it's historical at times um, and focuses a lot on um, intelligence or, you know, the power structure. Really, it's all about uh, interrogating power, I guess you could say at this point, but tends to do a lot with them. Um, intelligence or, you know, oligarchs, uh, the eugenics agenda, all other sorts of, of stuff like that. Definitely very influenced by, by your work, James, and some of the topics that you've covered over the years. I very much appreciate that. Uh, as I say, I very much appreciate this work. I appreciate you taking the time at late at night there uh, where you are for to, to go over this. I know you've been doing a lot of press about this and talking about it. So sorry to make you regurgitate all of this once again, but I, I <laughs> no, do. No, not at all. I, I I'm, genuinely, I'm thrilled to be on the Corbett Report. So. Well, I genuinely want to obviously put this before the Corbett Report audience and let people know that it exists. If you like my work, I think there's a good chance you're going to get something out of this work. Um, uh, let's let's put it that way. So once again, the notes, uh, the show notes for today's interview will have the links to all of the things we've just mentioned. I hope people will uh, check out this book. Whitney Webb, take some much needed rest. And I definitely hope we <laughs> will try. be able to talk uh, more in the future about this. All right. Yeah. Thanks so much.